Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Inner Athlete Training Podcast. I'm your host, James Jankowitz, and I have an amazing guest with us this evening, Dan John. Dan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, yeah, thank you. It's been a, it's been a long, crazy day, but things are okay. <laughs> so, trying to travel. Yeah. Trying to travel nowadays is just always like, you know, for, and it's an adventure before you leave, before you leave your basement. You know? <laughs> Are you traveling a lot these days now, now that we're yeah. sort of getting out of COVID a little bit? Well, especially on the military stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. It, of course, you know, on, on American military bases, everyone's, you know, everyone's got all their vaccinations. They got their boost. They're, they're all up to date. Um, and it's just, it's nice. I mean, and so and I, I do so. Yeah. Um, but here we go. Yeah. So just, okay. it's awesome. just, just weird to, to get from here to there. You just flights and weather can, flights canceled weather, all kinds of stuff, but it's all this. That's, that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're out of the, the COVID era. I'm glad we're out of it and things are starting to open up again. It's been two very long trying years for everybody. So here we are, but that's sort of like how you and I met. And that's what I want to talk about that for one second. I, as you know, I'm producing a film or working on a film on the history of physical culture. And mm -hmm. that's how you and I met. You were kind enough to do an interview with me one time at one of the Perform Better Providence, workshops. Right? I'm sorry? Providence, right? Providence, yep. Yeah. Yep. And so that's where we first connected into that initial interview. And that was right, you know, what, like six months, eight months before COVID hit. And so I was like plugging along with that project. It was going really well. And then COVID hit and just like everything else with everybody else just hit the pause button for a little while. But we're finally resurrecting it again. And that's kind of why I wanted to have you on the podcast to start expanding that notion and talk a little bit about what we talked about in that initial interview for the film. Sure. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you do have a background in theology, theological studies, mm -hmm. a hist you're, you're a Fulbright scholar, right? And yeah. so just give us a little bit of that background um, in your own words, and then let's just... Uh -huh. You and I just have a discussion about the history of physical culture from as far back as you and I can recollect up to where we are now. Well, um, you know, after getting back from the Middle East, um, you know, I was always very competent in, you know, in uh, sacred scripture studies anyway. But when I got back from the Middle East, after having those experiences, and, you know, sometimes it was just a day trip. It wasn't like... Uh, intense study and sometimes it was kind of intense study kind of depending on where I was but, but Dan let's even back up a little bit there like what prompted you to go to the little e to the Middle East that was a scholar scholarship yeah enterprise yeah. right scholarly yeah. enterprise yeah so uh <laughs> it's funny to look at all the there was a series there was a there, there was a series of really good uh, presentations that I went to and then one of the people uh, on Middle Eastern studies and things like and uh, that kind of thing. I, I really enjoyed the conversations and I met some of the people who are running it and we just had these. And then I started this unit at the school I was teaching at Judge Memorial, where we brought in professors to talk about, you know, it was interesting because they were always way, I mean, I could never keep up for the, except we'd bring in a professor and it would take me four days to catch the kids back up onto um, to just a few of the things the person said, you know, and they'd be like, I'd have to show them on the map, the place they were talking about. I mean, not the place, the country they were talking about. And right. so it was kind of fun. It was a real challenge. And uh, from that, uh, I was asked by uh, Bob Staub if I wanted to apply for this. Uh, the first thing was, did I want to apply for this consortium job up at uh, uh, just opportunity up at Portland state. And, and I took that and I said, yes. And, so I studied intensive Turkish and I took a, God, a course. The course of the class was five hours every Wednesday. <laughs> oh, it was brutal on Yemen. And so, you know, and if you're ever wondering about Yemen, I'm your guy. Uh, and I had these <laughs> other courses and they were just, you know, and they were good. And then because of that, um, some other, some of the other professors in the program said, we need to, we need to edge this guy along a little bit. So I received this really, this very important uh, offering uh, of a scholarship, uh, uh, kind of a life changer. And so I went to the Middle East and, and there you go. I mean, I'm, you know, and I, I wrote a, oh gosh, two, 300 page book after it on, uh, my thought was adding Middle Eastern studies into the traditional um, Western civilization curriculum mm. in appropriate places. And it's interesting because the second I did that, I just got fired upon by, oh, it was just, 
it was, I remember sitting down with one of the advisors. It was very good. It was very simple. Here, there was some real logical spots to bring in the study of Islam, and of course, that'd be the bipolar world of the you know uh, the twelve hundreds. Then you go back in the history of Muhammad. Right? It was just logical. Uh, it was just logical. And oh my God, the pushback! I mm. never realized. Uh, yeah, the religious wars that just erupted because I wanted to teach appropriately Middle Eastern studies in a Western civilization concept. Wow. The problem we usually have in Middle Eastern studies is you jump from Ramses II. He built like uh, he, he was the great conqueror. You know, he built all this stuff. He was the great builder. Well, mostly he defaced the other pharaoh's names off and put his name on. Um, and then you jump to Cleopatra, which would be like basically going from, you know, I don't know, uh, William the Conqueror to uh, Queen Elizabeth in one sentence, the second, you know, it's, there's a bit of gap in that, you know, there's, a, there was all these gaps and uh, actually it's even more than that. It'd be, well, don't worry about it. But there was these huge gaps in the way we, we taught Islam, the way we taught the, 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 the Jewish experience, the way we taught uh, Christianity, there was these gaps and, and, oh, did it get crazy. So that never got published, which is good. And I don't even, I don't, I don't think I have a copy anymore. Um, but uh, so I, I taught, uh, I taught a long time, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it this week, uh, religious studies, uh, theology, and depending on where you are. And then I started teaching for Columbia College for the better part of 25 years, religious studies that I invented a course called um, religion and human experience. I didn't invent the course. I invented the course online. I took the title of their course, and then I developed it into an online class. Interesting, small story, uh, James, just the, when I was first hired, they said, there's an opportunity like once a year to teach a class of maybe 20 students on the internet online. And I'm like, wow, that will be weird. Well, I never, I, my class filled up the very first time we ever taught it. There was two courses, the second quarter or whatever we had. Uh, yeah, we, well, just say quarters, simplify things. There was three, four. Pretty soon it went all the way up to K. Uh, you know, I had uh, 101A, 101B, 101C, 101D, but other people had to be hired to teach it all the way up to K. So there was a time where really one of the most popular courses on the campus was mine. Uh, so it just, and so that uh, takes you up to uh, where I retired last uh, June from that position, oh, wow. because uh, actually it was, this is going to sound weird, but it was getting in the way of other things I want to do with my life. The downside of online education is it's asynchronic, which means there is no now, so noon is, there's 24 noons on the planet earth every day. <laughs> right. So when you're teaching asynchronically, now is 24 there's 24 nows so if i have a student in japan has an issue they email me and i'm in, i'm asleep and i and they email me again they'll email me again they'll call my phone they'll call my phone and then of course five six hours later i'll get this really you never answer your emails <laughs> you like remember i told you i sleep almost every night now uh <laughs> I don't just sit here waiting for your emails um what drove me from uh, online education was uh, good, good reasons. I mean, there was uh, students, um, I, I, I struggle with the modern student. Um, the concept of cut and pasting and considering that your own work, I considered it cheating. Um, some mm -hmm. students said, well, I found it online, so I get to use it. Yeah, well, it doesn't mean you wrote, you know, Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle into That Good Night. Right, right. Face it. Most of us know you didn't write it. <laughs> and I know you worked really hard pressing what control C and then scrolling down and then control, control you know, D. I, D. I mean, that's, that's impressive, but it's not, <laughs> it's not exactly the same it's as not the same. Macbeth or Hamlet, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, uh, I get, and th these were all college level classes. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, I know I taught uh, I taught high school and then uh, I taught college, but then I was the uh, uh, I was the the director of religious education for the Catholic Diocese of Salt Lake City. Oh gosh, what about eight ten years I guess. And I of all the jobs I've ever done, being an administrator, I was shocked. I was shocked at the skill set I had because mm -hmm. um, and I would, it's funny I was just talking to my friend Andrew about this. Any idiot can find problems. 
but I, I look for people who find solutions. And by being someone who just focuses on solutions, I think it made me a good administrator because things, bad things always happen. <laughs> quick, quick story. So 9-11 comes around, uh, you know, the, the towers, the Pentagon, uh, Flight 93. About two or three days later, my wife is still stuck in Manhattan. She was in Manhattan when the planes hit. And I had this woman come in and complain to me about the hotel I picked for this conference. And I, I just got off the phone with a crying wife. And I'm like, yeah, you are a classic problem finder. And, right. uh, and I curse, I cursey, you know, uh, yeah. uh, so, but yeah, when you work, when you work in, um, I don't know, church, you get used to the fact that a lot of, a lot of people who like to find problems are in church work. And, and uh, as long as you keep swimming above it, you'll be successful. Hmm. Yeah. So that's, so that's a little bit of your academic, your, your theological background. Um, and I bet, I mean, obviously people know you for that, but I bet you that's a smaller group of people yeah. than the people who know you for your, your list of athletic accomplishments. So before we get into the discussion, just give us a brief background on your training. Like, you know, when did you get involved and oh, you've been doing it oh. your whole life? I know. And then, and then we'll intersect the two and, and sure. discuss, have the deeper yeah. discussion. My, my aunt died in 1965 and she left us some money and my brothers drove over to uh, Sears and bought the Ted Williams Sears barbell set. <laughs> and, uh, awesome. And I have the, I still have the pamphlet in the, my uh, bookshelf over there in the other, in the other room. And um, I just kind of fell in love with progressive resistance exercise. I thought this idea that, uh, you know, you, you, you do something, if you keep at it, you get better at it, um, just appealed to me at at the most basic level. And that's still anything that in, in life that's progressive seems to really reach out and kind of touch me. You know, I like progressive things. I like things where, um, you know, like in the discus throw, you know, you might not be very good because of your DNA, but if you work at it and work at it and work at it, you'll get better and better and better. And you will be a good thrower if you put your, 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 you know, your, your time, treasure and talents towards that. And I've always liked that about sports and, and writing. And I'm sure song, musicians, musicians would say the same thing. It, it's the process of learning and exploring. And it is goal setting 101, a goal achievement 101. And uh, I, I, so in 1965, I started lifting weights. Uh, I started my journal. This is the 1991 one. I'm just, I was just reviewing the 1991 journal. Wow. Uh, um, so you've but, kept journals your entire life for this? No, no, just since 1971. So it's kind of new. 19, for me. Okay, okay, yeah, kind of new for me, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I, I figured out early on that uh, if you think even a little bit, you can you can really get ahead of most people in almost everything. Mm -hmm. I just had a conversation about you know when you teach as long as I did, you you begin to discover. I, now this isn't completely true. My 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 attorney paul is you know attorney of the year here for utah another one of my students ed uh is a professor at columbia uh, at law school in new york but most of the time so many of the students who are really good in the high school setting are superior memorizers mm. and in life they don't do very well and it's going to sound weird i'm not saying they don't do that they do fine they, they do fine but they're very good at following rules and memorizing things. And if you had to, if someone had to vomit out more facts than anybody, they would win the vomit facts contest. Right. But thinking is different. And what I always loved about strength and conditioning is I always felt I could outthink, I kind of sound like survivor, outthink, out, you know, I, I, I always felt like I could, okay, okay, I, if I tweak this little thing, and then and, and work on this and buy those shoes and try out this idea. Maybe, you know, I, I, I love that about uh, lifting weights, throwing the discus, American football. I love the idea that I could, I could outthink and outwit my opponents. And then, of course, DNA kicks in. I mean, there's no question about course, that. Yep. I mean, that's just the truth. But you can get to be pretty darn good. I and mean, so, I don't know, what was my freshman year of high school? I wanted to be in a, a uh, wanted to play professional football and 
Um, I read a book, uh, it's right there, um, Seven Days of Sunday. A guy named Kenny Avery was a professional linebacker uh, for, the, for the Giants. And in the spring, he, he ran the hurdles through the shot and through the discus. So in the spring, I did the hurdles, the shot and the discus. I wasn't very good at the shot because of puree. And uh, I hurdled for four years and then, but I got really, really good at the discus. And then I went off to uh, junior college, Skyline, and a small, quick story. Uh, in 1971, I bought the book, The Track and Field Omni Book by J.K. Doherty. And in it, it said that Ralph Mon at Utah State University was basically the best coach in America. And I told my sister, I want to go to Utah State and throw the discus for Ralph Mon. Six years later, I got a phone call. Hello, this is Ralph Mon from Utah State University. I'd like to offer you a full ride. That's so great. be careful. Be careful what you dream about or think about because you become it or wish for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I went off and I was a, I got, I was MVP in high school, junior college and Utah state. And then um, I stuck around Utah state to pick up a, 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 a master's degree in history while I coached the track and field team in the weight room. So in, I might've been one of the first and it, you could argue the first, um, collegiate strength and conditioning coach for uh for track and field i don't well, know anybody else who's who's earlier and there's a lot of people since but i don't know anybody earlier but and, and um and then i in what what time era was this 79 okay 80 81 and then i got my master's i started teaching and uh, still competing on the side um the eighties were good and bad. When I went to the middle East, I got very ill from a liver parasite. So mm -hmm. I couldn't really do much for about three or four years after that. I was very ill. And then the nineties, um, some things kind of happened in my life that got me going again. And so I had a really good early nineties as an athlete and then kids and, uh, administrative job. And then about 1998, the internet showed up and started having these conversations with people about weightlifting. It got me going again. My best years as an athlete were in my late 40s. Mm, uh, that's that, fascinating. That's, uh, threw the discus really, really far. I was uh, one of the best Highland ga gamers in the world, and you know, um, and I like I like the path I took. I do. I like the path I took. Um, it was always long term focused. Always hey, up there. Those magazines are called Strength and Health. I've always been very concerned about my health as well as my strength. I've always worried about longevity, you know, uh, all those different things. And I think it's, and it's paid off, you know, I'm still competing uh, two weekends ago. I was on the platform and, you know, and I'm a couple months from now, I'll be back on the platform and just keep on keeping on, you know, that's awesome. So you feel like you peaked in your early forties. You don't hear too many people say that I mean, we have Tom Brady, who's, who's 40, still going strong. In his form, but yeah. 40, for, uh, 47 was probably my best year. Wow. That's so inspiring yeah. <laughs> for a lot of people, you know? Yeah. So I went to, he just, I just, he just died sadly, but I was at a track track meet at the Ohio state university. I was mm -hmm. 47 years old and I'm throwing and this very famous coach, uh, Judd Logan walks over to me and goes, I've read all your stuff. I go, good. And he goes, I'm so glad you throw far. I go, well, what do you mean by that? He goes, you know, I read this stuff by people all the time and they've never thrown anything. And so it's just so academic. They talk about angle of release and it, which isn't, I mean, frankly, you know, height of release, angle of release. Yeah, they have a value, but not nearly as important as speed at release, you know, they right. write these articles and they miss, you know, the, the, you know, uh, give me a cliche. They miss the blank because of the blank, you know, uh, yeah, they, uh, and so he was very, it was kind of, we had a great conversation about the fact that I, you know, I, I, I talked to talk, but I also walked the walk and I, you know, I'm still trying to do that at 65, you know. And you're still a record holder in some of these categories. Am I correct? Yeah, in fact, I, I, it wasn't official because it wasn't uh, a national meet, but two weekends ago, I broke the American record in the clean and jerk. Yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that is so great. So, um, and our backgrounds are not too dissimilar. I mean, I've been an athlete my whole life too. And I, I'm currently teaching history for a prep academy here in New Jersey, uh, oh. not online, you know, it, it's in real time, right? But uh, as you know, I always had this passion between history and physical education and, and that kind of thing. It's just always some, I also have a background in philosophy. I minored yeah. in school, right? So like you, our paths are not t terribly dissimilar. 
And that's why um, I wanted you to be part of the film. That's why I want to talk a little bit about it today, you know? So, so let's, let's, I don't know, let's just go back to, I guess, where it all started. I mean, you, from my research, I, we know games started with the Phoenicians, you know, with the Egyptians, like there's all sorts of history about these ancient cultures playing different sports and that kind of thing. Right. But, but I think it's safe to say it really kind of all exploded with the Greek civilization, yeah. right. Cause that's where the, the Olympics finally materialized. And, and the interesting thing I found about Greece is you had all these civilizations that preceded it, but there was something about that time in Greece that was magical because they seemed to have taken the best of everything that surrounded them and preceded them and synthesized it through great minds like Aristotle and Socrates and Plato and all those guys, you know, Pythagoras and whatnot. So, and to think it was such a time of um, intellectual explosion and athletic explosion, you know, is what I found really compelling as, as I took a deeper dive into that. A lot of people think they're separate. We have a lot of studies now emphasizing the fact that, hey, you know, when you work out, you know, your brain cells actually expand and you can think better and you can work yeah. better academically. And to think that the Greeks were doing that intuitively over 2,500 to 3,000 years ago, mm -hmm. because it wasn't, as you know, it just wasn't an academic thing for them. They would have time of the day where they would, you know, go to the academy uh, and discuss ideas and rhetoric and logic and all that kind of stuff. But then they'd be wrestling, you know, and then they'd be running and training and all that kind of stuff. So that's why I found that whole intersection very fascinating. Right. So let, let's just, you know, combined with your religious studies and uh, your history studies, like what have you found like from Greek civilization on up? Like how did it start and what are we doing now that we weren't doing back then and vice versa? Well, yeah. It's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny you said that about, you know, it, it, there's a great sign in Aristotle's uh, school. You know, those who do not understand geometry do not enter. Yep. And one of the things that I think we've lost is I think we've lost. So <laughs> I like what you said about philosophy. So <clears throat> theology is based on philosophy, but philosophy is based on geometry. And one of the things I, when you, this is going to be a, this isn't the answer you want, but you're getting stuck with it anyway, my man. It's... <laughs> you know, geometry begins with the proofs and there's all these things I call givens. They're the givens. So even in 2022, I still argue with people, not argue, I, I still try to shape people towards this idea that, you know, what are your givens? Well, there's two straight up. There's your genetics and your geography. Those are the two, you know, um, you're, are you still in New Jersey? I am. So right outside uh, of New York City. Yeah. Okay. So New Jersey used to be a big football state and used to be a great track and field state. Uh, you know, your, your throwers there are, are famous, You're a great throwing state. Well, if you grow up in certain schools in New Jersey, say in the 1960s or the 1970s, um, I can't remember the one school, but it's very famous, uh, you know, and you were a certain height and a certain, if you were a tight end or fullback, you were a discus thrower shot putter in the spring. So, because that's, that was the givens of that area. You played mm -hmm. football, and if you were fast and strong, you threw. Geography, genetics, and they they dance with each other. So I take that to the extreme. I mean, when I'm when someone asks me about programming, the first thing I ask them is, "What equipment do you have?" And the second question is, "What do you know how to do?" Because it doesn't always work real well to just give someone a program. So I want you to snatch Olympic snatch body weight. On Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, seven sets of two. Uh, what's the snatch? Well, you know, as you take the barbell and whip it over your head in one motion. I don't have a barbell. Well, that whole program I just said is worth it. The whole thing is worth it because you don't have the knowledge or the equipment or maybe the DNA either. So I think what's missing today is we don't always start anymore with the givens. Mm. You know, um, there are people, <laughs> I have a good friend, we've been joking about it. She won the uh, genetic lottery when it comes to feminine bodies. Okay, she's in her 50s, and um, no matter what she does, she just looks better. You know, and you know, there's, there's and I always joke about, you know, and all these women, they all hate you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, you know, one of the things that would make you notice, I met Wilt Chamberlain when I was in junior college. And one of the things you noticed about Wilt is he was the biggest man I've ever seen in my, in my life. 
and I and I knew Mark Eaton from the jazz pretty well. And Wilt made Mark look like a small boy. Well, you can't walk away from that given. From there, the to proves. And one of the things I liked about the Greeks is they were very good, no matter what the field was, they were very good about stopping and saying, what do we know? Hmm. And the stuff we don't know, well, here's a system to get us to there. Uh, I just think I just described philosophy fairly well for you, right? Uh, you know, and in fact, in theology, I mean, I used to tell my students, I don't care if you believe or not, just defend it. You mm -hmm. know, just defend it. And in yes. all situations, in yeah. all situations, uh, you know, it's great. You know, I love these people who tell me, well, I'm a libertarian because I think that's the word of the month is libertarian. I think it was on the roll of toilet paper, the word this month was libertarian. It's like, really? And then I'll say something that's just, and I go out of my way to find the most offensive thing I could think of at the moment. And is that okay? And you'll just see this. Well, I thought you believed that, you know, do what you feel, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. I maybe yeah. You know, and when people say they want, you know, the, the great, the great thing from the 1960s, um, it was at some kind of protest with hippies, sorry to say hippies and whatever they, you know, flower children. And the, and the, one of the guys said to a police officer, yeah, we're going to overthrow everything. And the, and the police officer says famously, he goes, Oh, okay. So when you overthrow everything, you come up with some new rules. And the right. person says, well, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Who's yeah. going to enforce the rules? Yeah. And to oh. your point, th those are great because those are your like your philosophy 101 arguments, right? You always have yeah. these like young kids who read Nietzsche for the first time. And they're like, well, there is no truth, you know, and, and they, they they're so cocksure that there's no truth. And then you challenge them on that. And it's like it's it becomes so self-evident to them in like one sentence that they're making a truth claim by saying there's no truth, right? So it's like, <laughs> to, so, so to your point, it, it's like you have those like very remedial um, arguments in the beginning. And also to your point, it's like what philosophy really helps you understand is like, you do have a worldview, you're a libertarian, you believe in God, you don't believe in God. But um, it, it's easy to challenge the presuppositions of those worldviews once you really know how to think like these ancient guys used to think. Yeah, my brother has a famous story. He was in Vietnam and they were getting hit by mortars and uh, the mortars go boom, 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 boom. And the fourth one usually triangulates and kills you. Well, it went boom, 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 dud. Mm. And everybody in that foxhole or wherever they were, all were believers for the rest of their life. Right. Yeah, and I'm not yeah. saying you have to be a believer or not. I'm just saying, you know, if you can stay, sit there while you're being shot by the at by the Kong or or that one group of Marines that were all shot in the back of the head, if you're the last Marine to get shot in the back of the head and you're still like, yeah, OK, yeah, you know, whatever, yeah. you know, whatever floats your boat, you know, kumbaya, you know, God bless <laughs> you. If you can hang on to that there. I'm not yes. ripping on non-believers. I'm not ripping on anybody. I'm just saying right. um, when it's your baby who's got that disease then we'll talk about things, you know? Right. You, yeah. Every, every, because, because your point, it's exactly, it's like, then you, you realize is the philosophical or even the theological ground you're standing on going to support you at that point. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people, like you said, they have a lot of platitudes about what they believe. And then the first real test, a lot of times it just collapses because it just wasn't very, you know, thought very well through to begin with. It's just something that sounded really good. You know, so yeah. they wanted to sort of jump oh, on it. it. It's like, oh, this fits my life. And yeah. 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 Well, the, the, when I was young, they used to say, if you're a if you're under 50 and you're not a liberal, you have no heart. If you're over right. 50 and you're not a conservative, you have no head. I mean, I just remember <laughs> <Right>. it. Yeah. <sighs> well, yeah. And, and most and most conservatives don't I mean, I, you know most conservatives don't want to conserve they want to go back to the way things used to be the great the great insight i got recently from a friend he said nobody wants the beatles to reunite everybody wants to look like they were when the beatles were together and i just <laughs> thought that is exactly that is perfect. that's the wish <laughs> that's a wish and you know yep. put that in your pocket and good luck on that good <laughs> That's awesome. So like in some of the um, other podcasts I've done earlier, um, we've been taking a ride, like I said, I've been doing a ride through history. And I've been using this book as a source, a, a history and philosophy of sport and physical education. I don't know if you ever came across this one. No, but it's but, fact. When you see the replay on this, you, the book disappears and comes back. Put oh, it sorry. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, hang on. Hang on. There oh, we go. Okay. Good enough. There we okay. go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> anyway, 
let's see if I come back into focus now. <laughs> but anyway, it's it's been it's 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 what they teach, and it, um, I got it from a professor of um, sports psychology at Montclair State University. He found it oh, sure. and he yeah. gave it to me. So it's been it's been really informative in terms of my earlier podcast about this topic. But the the reason I found it really fascinating was because it just you know so much of what informed the early Greeks and the early civilizations about how they trained and what training meant to them really came down to like, how did they understand and how did they perceive the body, the human body, right? And then the next big question was like, how do you resolve this issue between the brain and the body, right? Because there's a point in history where it became very clear that there, they seem to be two different things. See, you know, so there were some that, schools of thought saying they're separate and there were some schools of thought saying they're one. I'm sorry, go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah, see, I've never... I, I'm a, if, if people want to send, you know, bullets to me, uh, I'm still a big believer in the cornerstones of Western civilization. So I still believe yeah. in the unity of the body, mind, soul, and spirit. I still believe in it. And I still believe that, you know, when I'm on a team, I'm a better player. When the other 10 guys were all in the huddle and it's like, well, we're not, we can't let these guys score. I get bigger physically, I get bigger emotionally, I can take more pain and I can, I can push a little harder because I can't let those other 10 guys in this huddle down. That's and, interesting. Uh, um, uh, I believe that whenever I have something to fight for, to, 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 if there's a quest, uh, uh, if there's, a, there's something that makes me want to dig down and go after it, I, I always find that I just can't say, well, you know, uh, uh, James, uh, I want to, you know, just, you know, for like, just train like, you know, six hours a day for the next seven years, you know, right. Yeah. And then uh, throw the discus really far. That'd be great. Right. <laughs> I can't, I know. I just, you know, I've got to have something that, you know, when you look at the amount of pain and you go through as an athlete. And then you look at the relatively minor amount of pleasure, you know, you have to have e either you have demons in your head, you know, I, I still, I still like the old idea that bad kids have demons in them. I think it's a much simpler way to explain a lot of kids. Than, <laughs> it know, does uh, explain a lot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with Billy? He's got demons in his head. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's keep going. Let's move ahead. Uh, but you know, when, when there is something more, something bigger, uh, you know, when you're watching Saving Private Ryan and, you know, God, the guys who are coming on the second, third, fifth waves. I mean, think about those men on the fifth wave coming in and what are they, seeing? what are they seeing in front of them? You now that, you know, and, and, but something bigger drives you on something bigger drives you on. There's Absolutely. a movie I kind of I kind of think I like it sometimes. It's about snipers in Stalingrad, and it's got that the British actor who plays uh, Watson in uh, those not very good Sherlock Holmes. It, it, I like the show, but one of the things is that the Soviets would shoot their own men when they retreat. If they retreat, the Soviets would shoot them, and I, they would say, "We're doing this for Mother Russia." And then, of course, they were getting overwhelmed. They turned and ran because they didn't have enough weapons and ammunition. And so their, their, their leaders shot them for retreating. Um, I, I, that to me is not a good model for, you know, as a coach, anybody yeah. who does not give 100% <laughs> will be shot. Uh, uh, you know, you're not going to uh, get a lot of people on your team the next season. Yeah. yeah you're going to lose, you're going to lose players in the off season. <laughs> so for me, I've always thought that the body, mind, soul, and spirit, you know, there are engines that drive you to bigger and greater things. And again, you can, you can argue and disagree with it, but there'll be times in your life where you'll find yourself to do this. I need to be bigger than I am. Yep. Yeah, I agree. And Western history and Western civilization give you a context for that. You I know? think. It, yeah. And it bothers me that we're, we're, we're rushing so quickly away from it. Uh, there's a great book by David Denby, uh, D E N B Y called great books. And as an adult, he goes back to Columbia and he reads, he rereads in classes, the great books with other students. It's brilliant. And he goes, you know, when you're reading Genesis chapter 22 um, about killing your own son, okay, Abraham, you know, has to kill Isaac. It means nothing when you're 19. 
But when you have a son or a daughter and God's telling you, just we'll do everything you want, just kill your kid. It's a radically different. When you read King Lear and King Lear is ranting and kind of losing his stuff, that's fine unless you're dealing with somebody who has uh, dementia. And then all of a sudden it becomes, it's not King Lear anymore. It's Tuesday. And what he points out in the book that I think is brilliant is a lot of, there was a lot of pushback at Columbia, very intense, very well laid out debate points about uh, why we should get rid of the Western canon. But what he said was interesting is all the points they were making were based on the Western canon. Yeah. All their insights were based on what they were trying to. So their, their, their logic at attacking the canon was based on what they learned from the canon, which yes. I find fascinating. And I yeah. got not, I mean, you can kumbaya everything all you, all you like uh, until there's a, until there's a, someone trying to hurt your kids in your house and yeah. then we'll walk. Yeah. And Dan, uh, I agree because that, that's been my big frustration too. Certainly as I've gotten older, certainly as I've gotten wiser, certainly as I've become more literate in Western history and civilization, it's like, it's so easy to be so dismissive of it when you're young, because when you're young, you're exploring and you're yeah, sure. you know, <laughs> pushing back against the world, you know, and that kind of stuff, right? But but when you live in a world that doesn't challenge you the same way the ancient world challenged you, you, you don't have the right context. You're not even looking at it through the right lens. It's easy to dismiss church and the, the, the traditions and all that kind of stuff, but you have to realize at some point, that's what got us from like out of the muck and mire of the ancient world up to where we are today, you know? Right. So you have to believe that there's a richness, there's a gold in there somewhere that you can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, it's been politicized. Yes, it's been abused. Yes, it's been yeah. uh, used for, for the benefit of the state and for power, right? Sure. But, but I found the deeper I, like there was one point in my life I ran away from it, but then I switched my course. Instead of running away, I went deeper. And the deeper I got into it, that's where mm. I really found the real gold. Like it was laying there the whole time. It just got so covered up by modernity and yeah. their misunderstandings about what this stuff even meant. The tradition in studying sacred scripture is, you know, the first level is the story itself. And then the second and third le levels are more like, make sure you understand the play on words and make sure you understand, you know, what. and the fourth level is generally, uh, and, and there's a bunch of systems, just the one we used, uh, is what does it mean to you? Mm. And, and, and anytime, you know, uh, I, I just watched the new uh, Macbeth movie the other day, and it was interesting because uh, with the one Denzel Washington and the woman who gets, keeps getting Academy Awards every couple of years, she's in Fargo. I can't, I can't McDermott, me. Uh, oh, Frank, he, McDermott. McDermott, yeah. So, yeah. I know she's, so, she's such a talent. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, your drink just disappeared. That was fascinating. What's funny <laughs> about watching Beth again is when you're driving away, and with your friends and having that conversation about the movie, well, did you like it? And it's like, well, he, and, the, but that's it right there. That's what you want. That moment where it's like, well, he had so many different other ways that he didn't need to, why, you know? And that's yeah. when, I, that's when you put yourself in, you know, um, I often, I used to tell my students that a lot of them sadly were a lot like Macbeth is their parents had told them something they shouldn't know. Um, <laughs> one parent, uh, this is my boy and he's absolutely perfect in every way. Mom told me that. And I thought, oh, Lordy, 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 this, you, uh, you, you, oh. <laughs> there's, there's, there's someone, uh, there's a partner uh, of downstream from this poor kid who's in a world of hurt, a world, because you know what? Uh, his poopy doesn't smell like roses every single day of the week. And, uh, but, uh, you know, if, if you're, if, if you get too much information too soon about certain things, it doesn't help your path. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, Macbeth, and, and wasn't that even like the, the foundational story in the Bible, like don't eat at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? Like there's a certain, not that God was dismissing his, that knowledge as being bad, but as it's saying, it's sort of beyond your, ability to understand it right so don't go diving into that because it's not going to do you any good and of course we well, are, who we are so that, we do so if you read if you read genesis and don't if i go too deep don't just tell me to shut up no please go deep go deep but the first <laughs> that's what days, we call it inner athlete training <laughs> the first three days are day are, are separation 
so day one, um, you know, it's uh, uh, the, the, the night and day. And night comes before day, separation. Day two, water's above, water's below, separation. Day three, there's a separation of the land and the sea. And then there's some stuff, something new, plants and vegetation. But day four, ornaments, ornaments the, the night uh, with the sun, the moon, pardon me, the moon and the stars and ornaments the day with the sun. Day two, birds and fish, ornaments the waters above and the waters below. Day three, ornaments um, the, uh, the, the wild animals, cattle and beasts. But get back to the separation, separation, separation. The knowledge of good and evil, separation. And instantly he realizes that it's man and woman, separation. And what's beautiful about the story, if you read it from that viewpoint, is that we have been, what the divisiveness, the divisiveness of separate, separate, separate is such an important part of those stories. And the second thing that I think is real important is when uh, God says, where are you? By the way, uh, there's the three great questions of the Bible. Where are you? First thing God says to, right, to Adam, first sentence in the Bible, where are you? It's a question. Am I my brother's keeper? And whom do you say I am? Those are the three great questions of the Bible. I, you know, you, there, I just summarized the Bible for you. But <laughs> when, when God comes down and says, hey, I told you not to eat from that. He goes, uh, the woman whom you sent told me to. And what's woman's first response? It was a serpent. So the very, it's great because in the very first moment, of human existence, as we would now call humans, our first response is, <clears throat> you know, that Pass you, know, the you, lean, you lean back and you point to the other person, you know, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's and so, uh, so separation is the big story of uh, separation is the problem with human existence, and of course, what we try to do constantly since then is, is the forces of some forces are driving us to unify, but as more are forcing us to separate. And all you need to do, I mean, it's it's tragic what's happened in the world. A uh, buddy of mine said, well, I don't, I don't want to get too political, but uh, when you go around and you look at all the hot spots on the planet, um, very often the groups are trying to separate into smaller and smaller and smaller tribes. I know I'm supposed to hate Bill Cosby now, but when I was young, he had this very good... Uh, it was like a document, a video, uh, whatever at the time, a, a, a reel that they would show schools where half his face was painted white and half his face was painted black. And in character, he said how much he hated everybody. He hated Jews, he hated Catholics, he hated Irish, he hated everybody. And then finally, at the end, he goes, the only person I like is my friend James. Eh, I don't like him either. <laughs> <laughs> the point of the story was all about separate, separate. Right separate separate and then one day you realize that you're all alone which is probably the opposite of what i consider the essential of what makes a human human and that's common union yeah come union yeah yeah and from my understanding of all this the, the philosophy and the theology of it especially in the western um christian tradition that's why the metaphysics of the trinity was so important right because to have three three people like in one nature or one essence yeah. was a way of sort of unifying where there wasn't like in philosophy that the separation that you're talking about is usually referred to as dialectics right yeah. and and in the christians i found, I found the deeper i got into it the the especially reading some of the early church fathers it was amazing how they like curse dialectics they're like we don't we don't even start with dialectics you know so this whole idea of separation is just something we're not it's we're not going to begin with it and that that's why the the idea of the trinity was so important because it was it sort of helped dissolve you know because once you have dialectics and you have separation like you said and then there's um the tendency to do a hierarchy right that one is better than the other or one's above the other Yep. Right. And then as a result of that separation, you have all these other problems that come as a result of it. And that's, again, that's why I found that the idea, like once I really started digging into trying to understand the Trinity, I found it really helped kind of in a, in a sophisticated way, kind of resolve some of that. 
Well, Martin Buber's great point, I and thou, the beloved you. So even stop saying you, you people, mm. thou. Get back to the, the, the holy thou use. You said a couple things there. On my junior college coach's door, Coach Lahati of blessed memory, he had a sign that said, a sound mind in a sound body, which is, of course, you know, a Greek, you know, like an I forget author. the Greek interpretation, but I remember reading that. Yeah. Mene, san, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Corpus, <laughs> mene, yeah, uh, it's been a long time. Yeah. But a sound Mensa, mind, corpor is something. Yeah. 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 A sound mind and a sound body. And we have, mm -hmm. um, so for me, that is very much the focus of where I've been. I've tried to be my whole life. It's weird because people, you know, when we, if we're in the weight room net right now, and I don't, I'm not trying to be a jerk, it'd be pretty obvious I'm pretty strong. It'd be very obvious I'm very strong at 65. And if we were doing some other things, I, I try to keep a sound body, but I've always been driven by the idea that I can never separate, I personally can't, my academics and my athletics. I can never do that. That's, there, there's not two things. And the one thing that was made me really, uh, that's my grandson yelling up there. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the things I always like so much about being a track and field, collegiate track and field athlete is that it was the norm for us to be academic and athletic. Yes. Mon told me one, that great story, Danny, I only recruit two, two kinds, uh, two things when I, I recruit, there's only two things when I recruit speed and smarts. I can teach the rest. Mm. And I thought that that's money. That is money, yeah. you know? So I, I can, I can, I can teach the rest. So that, so that's still where my, in my head is at. It's weird. That's where my head is at. My head is on top of my body and my body is, it's, it's mortal, but by God, I'm going to be fighting this thing to the bitter, bitter end. I'm going to, yep. I'm going to enjoy this holiday on the earth as long as I can. <laughs> right. And that's why um, athletics, I mean, anything arts or whatever the case may be, but that's why athletics, be I feel became such a prominent thing in, in the ancient world. It was because it was that intersectionality and you can't just talk about athletics as you were alluding to before Dan, right? It's like, you can't just be like, you know, have an armchair discussion about it. Eventually you're going to have to go out and throw that disc, you know, and, or you're going to have to do the, the somersault or I did high jump and pole vault you know, oh. which pole vaulting is very mechanically, as you know, very mechanically yeah. complicated and you're up in the air and you're upside down, you know? And so there's a lot of forces that are really yeah. conspiring against you <laughs> when you put that pole in the ground and go up. Yeah. So, but even then when I was doing that as a teenager, I kept thinking, how did they even develop this? Right. It's like, yeah, I, I'm the beneficiary of all these you know, um, handouts they're giving me and all these exercises I can do, but somewhere along the line, somebody developed all this, you know, and had to figure Bit it all out. The track and field Omni book. Um, he has the history of it and it's, and which it's, book is that? Uh, JK Doherty's track and field Omni book. Okay. And, and uh, what, I mean, some of the events like the discus and the long jump and the course running, those are weak. I mean, uh, javelin, I mean, those are just weak. Yeah, that's pretty easy to figure out. Those are ancient games but the pole vault was a combination of of fairs f-a-i-r fairs mm -hmm. where you would stick this thing in and, you, and people try to climb up them in some places of of europe and in other places you try to get on to something and then of course they realized that that's a great uh attack tactic tactic against castles but it's also a great thing for evasion and, and escape right so the pole vault actually is uh, by the way, most of the events on the men's uh, gymnastics uh, come from the military tradition. The Palmer horse literally is to practice horseback riding and mm -hmm. the rings and all that other stuff is escape and evasion. So uh, really, and, yeah. So generally, most of the sports that I love really do have a fairly heavy military bent to them. Uh, I tell people this all the time, and I could be wrong, but I don't think so, is I think the two most ancient games are tag and hide and go seek hmm. and tag teaches you how to hunt and elude uh and elude hide and go seek teaches you that other skill set uh of of evasion uh my brother gary is a joke one time but i i remember it like it was yesterday vietnam vet said he thinks he survived vietnam because of hide and go seek games as a kid hmm. he learned to 
you know, when it, when it's appropriate, duck and cover, you know, and, uh, yeah. and, so, and disappear. Yeah. And so all these, all these things we're discussing, um, and, and it's sad sometimes that we pull ourselves away from these great traditions. Cause I think it's important to talk about, you know, um, you know, I, I, when you look at the, they're going to get rid of the modern pentathlon out of the Olympics, I guess. And that is where you ride a horse, you swim long distance, you shoot and you fence. But that I mean, we're, we're going to take that sport out, but it's, God, it's a, it is, it is how we train cavalry men in the 1800s. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, yeah. And I found that too in my research, like even going back to the Phoenicians and the, the Egyptians, like so much of what evolved into what we call athleticism came from trying to be a better soldier, you know, a more competent yeah. military person, right? Like you said about throwing the spear, clearly that was a hunting tactic, <laughs> yeah. right? So a lot of these can like be traced back to the earlier roots, but I didn't know about, about the pommel horse. That, that, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we could walk through you know, my favorite, one of my favorite things in the winter games is the biathlon, the cross country ski and shooting thing. And I keep I was thinking, just watching that the other day. Yeah. And I keep telling people, I don't know why we just don't, as Americans, we should have the biathlon should be standard practice for every one of our, especially army guys, you know, because it is a skill to shoot when you're exhausted right. and why not make a great Olympic team out of it at the same time, you know? Yeah. Uh, so we, we, so we dabbled a little bit in the ancient world, but what can you tell us now about, let's say the 1700s, 1800s as exercise, as we went from doing these events and be, it became more exercise, it became more part of the uh, consumer culture. Well, can, can you walk us through a little bit of that? Well, I mean, I could even go back a little bit farther. You know, Henry VIII was a hammer thrower, Scottish mm -hmm. hammer thrower. And basically the hammer was a, the hammer was a broken axle off of a wagon. And so they would pick it up and, and throw it. And he was a champion hammer thrower before the effects of certain diseases he picked up for uh, reasons we don't need to discuss here, right. <laughs> uh, which caused him a lot of history. But uh, as I understand it, it, it's, it floats around in the 1600s and the 1700s. But in the later 1700s, there's, there's, it starts to become organized again, as I understand this. Right. Yeah. And, and by the time that the 1800s roll around, there are, it becomes kind of a, kind of a very much a club or, or uh, it becomes a, a club in a sense of a club, a place where people go to hang out and to hang out. And they were called turnarines in those early days. That right? would be in because Germany, in Austria, right? Right. Yeah. But don't forget, there was also massive uh, um, uh, mountain climbing clubs and there was all kinds of things going on and people were getting together in these areas and enjoying the the spectacle of mountain climbing or whatever you know mm -hmm. um but what we would recognize as true military uh the, the, the would be one uh it would be the introduction of oh, sorry about my dog no, the introduction okay. of the the flintlock and those early kinds of rifles where you had to you had to do i think it was 43 steps to shoot certain kind of rifle i can't remember which one it was but there was 43 steps to do it so you had to load put the thing down put the thing in put the thing down and this is where the word drill instructor comes from someone mm. who can teach you the drill well once you have a whole group of people all doing this at the same time and putting the powder in and the, then you have to start competing and playing around. Then you have to have these marching competitions. If you ever go to Ireland, they have a thing called the tattoo where these massive bands show up in this kind of, I wouldn't say ancient, but a couple hundred year old tradition of marching bands show up. And it's mm -hmm. fascinating because here in, in American football, in the collegiate level, the marching band in certain parts of the country is still as important as anything else. Yeah. So I, what I, I guess what I'm saying is, it's not unusual for humans to want to get together with a shared passion, organize it, make it even bigger than it is. Right. Right. And, I, and, I, and you look at the 1800s. I mean, the, the, the country, the society as a whole was becoming more organized, more factories, more people were going to more urban living, less rural living. Like everything was sort of becoming systematized. So it would make sense that your athleticism and your physical activity would as well. Right. Right. And, 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 
and the thing is before I would, it'd have been interesting to know what really happened in the fairs. We don't really have as much history on it, but we know in Scotland, for example, that there was Highland games. Uh, Braveheart has the stone pudding and, but I'm pretty sure stone pudding and probably a bunch of other things were just standard at the fairs, the regional gatherings. Right. Right. And the only problem is we just don't, because it, because history, history doesn't give us everything. That's a hard thing. So we're missing what, what was really going on you know we know that they had them we know that you know john of Loxbury made you know two pence selling you know banjos or whatever the hell you know uh but we don't really know what happened at these five to 14 day events you know so i'm pretty sure there would have been some kind of sport there um the maypole traditions i mean those those things have been around so long but and they stick we explain do, the maypole traditions i don't really know if i can it, and uh, the other thing it does vary by culture to culture but it is a a recognition that spring has come by is is around okay. and it it some argue that this goes back to the water so easter comes from eoster which was a spring goddess spring as in water water goddess right. and uh, so so many of our spring uh traditions uh, they, have, they have a real hint of you know woo uh, festival to them, right? Uh, right. Now, if you ever get a chance to go to Sweden at at, uh, at, at there's a, they have a day in Sweden every year that the sun never goes down, and they have intricate stuff they do. There's a frog dance, and there's a they go like this a few times. All my all of our Swedish listeners are probably rolling their eyes with my. Uh, there's a tradition of everyone running down naked and jumping into the lake. And there's all these, tra- these traditions. And when you ask where it comes from, you'll get the whole look like, mm-hmm. I don't yeah. know, I doing it when I was I, my, uh, my whole life. And you talk to grandpa, where'd they come from? My whole life. And right. then you find out that these things have been around a long time. And I, I just think it's, it's a natural part of us. When we get a bunch of humans in an area, we try to, uh, you know, measure ourselves against everybody else around. And that's what I just define sports for you. Yeah. I'm trying to measure yeah, exactly. myself. And, and when done in the proper context, oh my gosh, the lessons you learn are just invaluable. That's why you take them directly from the field right into your life. You know, mm-hmm. can you deal with failure and success gracefully? Like that is, man, if you can learn that at 15 or 16 years old, I, I you said, know, your life will be measurably easier. I don't know if I told you this before, but uh, if I did, if I repeat it, I'm sorry, but there is something special about a public failure when you're 15 or 16. Now it can be just a drop ball in a sophomore football game. No one cares, right? But you do. You do. It's your whole world. And the nice thing is it's better to have a public failure where you have a supportive staff, even though everyone might be mad at you, but they're still and then you get a chance to fix it versus having a public failure at age 70 and you don't have the toolkit to deal right. with it. You right. know, um, you know, when someone doesn't get, someone has their toys taken away from at 75, it's not a pretty sight for the first time right. in your life, you know? Yeah. Um, so what can you tell us about, what's your understanding of the history of gymnastics? I understand like when it came to the U S we had a German tradition and I think it was a Swedish tradition. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and there was an intersection of the two. And I think most of what we understand about um, gymnastics today came from the German or it came from the Swedish tradition, if I'm correct about that. Well, there's, yeah, it's funny because, you know, for when I was young, is we, we would call them Swedish stall bars in a gym. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Was, it, the, the Swede, the, uh, Swedish massage, you know, um, when when all that came over um and by the way so did rock climbing from the german tradition that mm-hmm. uh the, the mountains around pennsylvania were very popular uh they're, they're not really mountains if you're from utah but you know that right. became you know a tradition of you know scaling and stuff but it was always the military application of those um i i, I work with the royal uh, well a royal uh, army uh, physical training corps RAPTC, and they give me they uh, they're if you get a chance to go to their museum if you get a chance to look what you'll see in there where is their museum uh it's it's in uh it's in the middle of england somewhere 
Okay. And I shouldn't. But the problem I have when I go on these trips is they drive me to these places and I'm always lost. Right. <laughs> right, right. I, I'm ne I never know where I'm going. But when you look at, for example, here's a quick example. Um, one of the ways they trained uh, guys in World War I and World War II is they gave them a dummy shell that weighed the exact amount as the shell. So they had 42 pound shells. And they had a whole, so they were doing good mornings with them. They were squatting with them. They were mm. doing virtual squats with them, pressing them, curling them. They were taking them everywhere. And if you made a mistake, you had to carry it all day long. I always think that what got things into the general public was always the military channel first. That's a, a thought I, I kind of think is true. Yeah, uh, I would agree. There's pictures, uh, and my dad even talked about it, but there's pictures of guys in w preparing for World War II, and they've got little blocks on the ground about this big, and basically they have those old stick and cement can. When I was young, people made their own weights with cement cans on the ends wow. of sticks. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And yeah, and yeah, and you would lift them, and there's a whole other... Uh, Gray Cook has a picture of it where there's just, you know, there's maybe 300 men with all with their own stick and cans and they're right all in this position here, getting ready to press. Wow. And so what very often happens is um, when you conscript, you draft a whole bunch of people, then you need to bring them up to what you would consider par for fighting. Right. You know, um, And so I've always thought that gymnastics floats in these small clubs and these one-off things when the needs of the nation expand we steal from there and it and then from there it funnels you know honestly I, I i rip on yoga way too much but what americans consider yoga is probably only 100 years old hmm. this and, and it's probably one it's probably got the you know how bikram was a serial liar uh yes you know, yeah. yeah well yeah, quite, uh, yeah. Uh, that that's a major tradition in yoga is to come and say all these things to rich Americans and they believe everything you want. Having said that in our field, hucksters have always dominated our field, my field always. And they always will. Uh, people always want to take a, if I can take a pill, it will, you know, and the placebo effect is mighty. My friend, the placebo yeah. effect is strong with this one. I feel like yoga right now. Um, uh, but so much, so much of what we do in America and, and, and oh well, every, every place in the world is we, we bring in things, we sample it, some of it remains, some of it becomes mainstream and normalized. And very quickly, you forget that its roots are Renaissance fairs, uh, somebody trying to find a new a weapon system, the discus, an attempt to find a new weapon system. Can we throw stones at our enemy? Was that uh, where the discus came from? It was that yeah, was a, a, a yeah, means of weapon weapon weaponizing it. Yeah, it was just okay. not very not a very effective uh, not a very effective uh, weapon. I will say this though: uh, the only sport specifically named in the Bible to Maccabees, uh, uh, Second Book of Maccabees, at the sound of the discus, all the young boys came running. And then, of course, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, Ulysses in part two, of course, is a champion discus thrower. So I want to make a big deal as a discus thrower, but it is the only sport mentioned in the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Bible. And the Bible. Uh, well, I don't want to make a big deal, but, you know, maybe we should all talk about the discus more, okay? <laughs> Point taken. <laughs> yeah. so, but, so, yeah. um, but I think as you study all this, one of the things you're going to pick up on is the threads are going to be um, you'll see something that seems like it's always been around and then you'll, you'll, you'll peel back a little bit on that thread and realize that it came from here. It became popular because of a specific reason. And then like, I'd be interested to know why saunas became so important in America, but then spend a day here in Utah and it'll make more sense this time mm. of year, you know, cause it's cold and it's, and if you're going to have a, a men's club, you know, uh, it's nice to have a place that, you can get warmer. Oh, and you're going to, you're going to sweat it all. You're going to sweat off all the, you know, the toxins from last night's, uh, you know, whiskeys. Yeah. <laughs> By the so way, that, that matter. said, what, what, what do you know then about like some of the more contemporary exercises we still practice today? 
bench press, shoulder press, uh, the Olympic sure. lifts, which you're an expert at. Where did those, those start crystallizing? Well, here's the interesting thing. In the of the exercises you just mentioned, the bench press is probably the newest. It's probably, now, it could have been around in Germany, but most people think the popularity of the bench press comes from Father Judge at Notre Dame. And uh, years and years ago, I was at a gathering and I met one of my heroes, Rocky Blyer. And he was just signing books and you could just see, he was just bored. And I said, do you have any stories of Father Judge? And he went, what? And he goes, you stay here. I want to talk to you. <laughs> because I knew who Father Judge was at, at Notre Dame. And there's a good chance that the, there's a good chance. If I said the bench press was 80 years old, I don't think I'd be exaggerating. 40s, 50s. It's wow. probably the newest of the exercises. And a lot of people thought it was a terrible exercise when it first came out. And most of the guys, they would spot themselves. They would do a pullover and bench press first. And that changed quickly. Um, the Olympic lifts, as we know them, is probably only from the 1932 Olympics. Uh, before that, um, the competitors at the uh, Olympic lifting would agree on what exercise to do. The crucifix, you know, you hold weights out for time, was one yeah. of the lifts at the Olympic Games. Maybe, yeah, I think it's 32 is when they, they actually started lifting as we would recognize it today. And actually, the, originally it was five lifts, the one arm snatch, the one arm clean and jerk, the clean and press, the snatch, the clean and jerk, five lifts. If that that thing was must have been a marathon. Of course, they didn't take three and a half hours between attempts. So you know, maybe they went right. back. <laughs> of course. Uh, exercises like the squat. You know, you look in and you'll know that from the Hindu tradition and the wrestling traditions of Afghanistan and oh, that whole region. The squat. And by the way, what we call the Turkish getup, whatever you want to call it, uh, Otto Arco. By the way, is one of the greatest of all time. He was um, Rodin's the thinker. Okay. That's yeah. Otto, Otto Arco was the bodybuilder who was his model. He weighed 132, but could do a single arm um, uh, Turkish getup, whatever you want to call it, with 165 pounds. So now, Turkish getup goes way back. The Turkish getup and the, the high rep squat, those might be the two of the oldest strength exercises we have. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I did... Um, well, I did a kettlebell certification under your, your organization. Right. And um, yeah, I remember that was one of the drills. And I, I remember thinking that's like, where did this whole thing come from? Uh, and yeah. to think that they developed this like way back that far ago. Yeah, like next that, time, but they obviously they weren't using a kettlebell, right? So would they, well, they were using rocks, I guess, or? But could you say, here, if you want to have a hard workout, grab a 50 pound sandbag, hug it to your chest, lay on your back and stand up, hugging that thing to your chest. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Seriously. It might, you might, it might be the hardest thing you'll ever do on your ab wall in your life. If right. you have any issues with uh, lingual hernias or whatever they're called, uh, umbilical hernias, you're going to, you might find that, just be very careful. Uh, some of the exercises, like when someone said they, they lifted a stone, so stone lifting traditionally was basically, we think, just picking it up. And if they did put it over the head, they only did the one side which of course gives us the Atlas picture. Okay. And right. Yeah. So the bench press relatively new, the Olympic lifts relatively new, anything, uh, anything, most of the time people, some of the big things were just clearing the ground with a heavy thing. It was called the back lift. You know, we get underneath a, a, a carriage and push it. You know, you just put your hands on your knees and, get the carriage off the ground that that was lifting uh in the civil war a popular thing in the cities would do a thing called the health lift we would call it the deadlift i mean um and it was <laughs> there was there you could you could join a place where once a day you came in and did a single deadlift and that was all your conditioning um one one deadlift yeah. In fact, don't, for many of our listeners that that'd be the best thing you could possibly do. It'd be uh, more like a one rep max. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll learn some things about yourself doing that. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. But, you know, most of the overhead stuff, the bench press, um, they're just, they're, they're more relatively new. Um, obviously stone put and the cannonball put and things like that. Those have been around for a while, mm -hmm. but you'll notice 
one thing that'll help you is if you look at track and field events and get the Omni book, so he gets or whatever book you can find with the history of track and field. And then some, and and so look at track and field, look at military applications of exercise. Um, and uh, you'll get most of what modern stuff is from, from the military application, you know, because track and field, I mean, there's, there's some things in there that, you know, evade, capture, fight, you know, mm-hmm. you know, the, the boxing and wrestling fight is fighting. Uh, the gymnastics is escape and evasion usually and fight in horseback. And then, and then just local, who's the strongest guy stuff. And then there's your Olympics <laughs> with some, right. with some few, few minor changes of technology. Yeah. And, you know, and you mentioned earlier, Dan, when you talked about when you're on a team, you know, the, the sense of the higher mission mm-hmm. that, you, that you feel right. And I always found like, I always found there's, there's two tracks there. Right. And the one track that I always was geared toward, and it sounded like you were sort of a hybrid yourself, but it, it's kind of like why I like track and field, right. The, the high jumping, the pole vault, I ran the 600 also. Uh, mm-hmm. But it was this feeling that you're part of a team, but your um, performance itself is very individuated, right? Whereas when you're sort of like in the team, you know, throwing the ball at each other, going, you know, um, running down the field to catch the ball or hitting the ball into the baseball field or whatever, it's, or in the lacrosse, you know, th- there's this relationship with everybody yeah. else, you know? And, and the two, I find it, it interesting because like, I don't know why I grab, I mean, I understand now, but like when I was younger, I didn't know why I gravitated more the, toward more the individualistic um, performance but still being part of a team, I think it says a lot about a person, you know, do you go toward one or the other, or are you balanced enough where you can actually participate on both? And and I still, I still recommend to high school kids that in their high school career, they do something that's individual and something that's team. Now the team could be working backstage at the the drama production or the the play. Right. Um, Right. Individual. If you have, if you can stand up in front of your classmates and talk, that's as courageous an act as throwing the discus. I think it's hard to do that. Right. So yeah. So for me, I think you need both. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how can people reach out to you if they want to know more? Oh, about yeah. Um, I have two websites. Uh, one is danjohn.net. It's about, if you decide to print it, you better get a new printing machine. It's about <laughs> 3,000 free pages of stuff and it, you're welcome to all of it. And then I have a paid site called uh, danjohnuniversity.com. And uh, if your listeners want to get a huge discount because I'm your friend, uh, if they just type in ESPEN on the code, ESPEN, ESPEN, uh, it'll be a huge discount. Uh, basically get three months for the price of one and try it out. I'm very proud of it. The workout generator is amazing. And obviously, if they have further questions for you, James, we'll just come back on the, uh, the next time we talk and we'll do it again. Yeah, love to have you back. You are a virtual encyclopedia of both academic and practical physical knowledge. So I thank you for sharing the, your time with us tonight. And I know my the people who listen to the podcast are really going to get a lot out of it. My best to all of you. And James, it's an, a, a, and I look forward to doing this again with you, okay? Yeah, and, we'll do it again. We'll, we'll do it again, hopefully sooner than later. Thank you, right. Dan. Thank you, my friend. Right. Good night.